I am the director of the Guelph Institute for Environmental Research. And welcome to our intimate fall gathering of thinkers, artists, scientists, philosophers, humans, all concerned with uh, the climate emergency, biodiversity emergency. Um, we will be starting with a land acknowledgement that I'm going to uh, give. Um, we are on the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and um, I want to remember for those of you who were here when GEAR launched in fall 2019, just before the pandemic, uh, we had a gathering uh, over in another building, in a science building. So we're just going to keep oscillating. <laughs> um, we had a, a gathering in the science atrium and we had about 100 researchers from the university, from all disciplines, gathered for that launch uh, for a year. People working on the environment from all aspects across the colleges. Um, and we were so fortunate to have uh, Kathy Jacobson, uh, uh, counselor uh, of the um, Mrs. Office of the Credit First Nation with us, and she gave a really, really beautiful speech that I wish I had recorded, um, but I didn't. And um, anyway, there were so many things in it, uh, so many teachings in it, um, and one of the ones that I would like to highlight, because it enters so much into the work that I do, and I think the work that many of us do, um, is this idea that um, what we're doing here is not for this generation, not for the next generation, not for the generation after that, 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 but for the generation after that. And this idea um, that comes from ind Indigenous culture and wisdom, as I understand it, as I've been taught it, um, is, is fundamental, really, I think, to everything. And it's pretty much the hardest challenge I feel for dealing with our crises. Um, so, um, yeah, it's the biggest, I feel like it's one of the biggest obstacles. So, um, we are also, um, gosh, I'm gonna get the uh, name of the, uh, the, ex the exhibit wrong, but we're gonna be talking with the, um, the art gallery director. Uh, we're surrounded by Inuit art <laughs> right now, if you had noticed already. Uh, this is a special exhibit that has been put together. Uh, you know, a selection, a, a selection of uh, a larger co collection that the art gallery uh, has. Um, and um, gosh, do you guys remember the name of the exhibit? It means, um, it, it's an Inuit word and it means um, every day. It's right there. I, Hot, it's pronounced Hotnut. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, I was told it orally and then I now I see it there. It's, um, yeah, it's pronounced Hotnut. It means every day in that um, So, uh, with that, um, I would like to just um, say a few words about gear and about how the day is going to go. Um, it's this is an experiment. This is a very diverse group of people. And um, yeah, the idea was to try to do something um, without any um, disciplinary notions. <laughs> um, so, but here we are. This is, uh, this is the Institute. It's still very new. Uh, and we are really trying to bring together researchers from areas that are uh, divided in institutions and in society. Um, one is the natural sciences and engineering, one is the social sciences, and the, and the third is the humanities and the arts. And um, these, you know, there's, these are quite rigid <laughs> divisions. Uh, they, the funding councils are completely different, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But we, we are trying to work at some of these intersections. Um, this intersection is being the hardest. Um, of all three, but uh, yeah, the, the Institute is currently supporting and trying to foster uh, research at the intersections of two or more of these areas. 
So hopefully today you'll see lots of examples of that. I know that you all are doing this, so um, that's why you're here. Um, and so the question that we asked everybody to uh, answer or just respond to with their own perspectives uh, is, is the challenge, really, because it's very hard to do, to do what we're trying to do. And, and, um, Many people are attempting it everywhere, but I really do believe that it is essential to uh, moving forward through these, these emergencies and crises. So, um, the format for today, as you know, is that everybody here is going to speak, and there will be more people coming in through the day, uh, and you'll be up here for about seven minutes or so. Um, we are recording, um, so hopefully everybody has, uh, is okay with that. Um, we will, we're not live streaming, uh, but we will use the recorded material after to, I think, write up some, some <laughs> summaries and reports and perhaps even make a shorter video that we would disseminate to a larger group of people who we can't have too many people here today. Um, yeah. Let's see, what else do I want to say? When we, when we come up, basically, I will call you by name. Uh, and if you could just very, very quickly say who you are in however way you would like to introduce yourself, because as you can see, we don't have the bios for everybody on our program. Um, I did put your institution, if you had a single one and it was easy to do, I put your institution. But I didn't indicate anything about your disciplines or why you're here today. So if you uh, don't mind just very briefly um, letting the group know, um, there'll be plenty of time to get to know one another at the coffee breaks and at lunch as well. Um, it's a small, intimate group. So I also wanted to acknowledge our, our, um, our guests, though, and show their books. <laughs> that I have and you can look through them. Um, Ray Armentrout and uh, Forrest Gander, around which this gathering has been um, put together, inspired. So, yeah, let's see, what are we doing for time then? Great. Um, that's a very short introduction. <laughs> we actually have time to relax a bit. Cause it, cause the official talks, or no, nine fifteen. Nine fifteen. No, we already are all, yeah. already over. This is all going to be edited out. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Super polished. Almost um, on time. <laughs> um, we're still here though. <laughs> And my talk is going to be seven minutes of trying to tell you a little bit about the science that I'm doing and a little bit about the poetry. <laughs> so there's a lot to fit in in seven minutes, and, and I'll just tell you that I have not figured out how to talk about them completely simultaneously yet. Um, maybe someday, maybe in 10 years. But for now, I, there's a little bit of a distinction, though there is overlap, okay? Um, <laughs> So, I just, yeah, I'm so excited to actually speak about my scientific work. I was talking with somebody the other day, maybe even yesterday, about how um, I'm not as excited to share it with fellow scientists. Um, why? It's an echo chamber, and, you know, we know, you know, we know what each other is doing, more or less, and um, I get really excited to talk about my scientific work with with people who are in other fields and in other disciplines. Like earlier this year, I organized a session at the Ecological Society of America, a primarily scientific meeting, but um, I went there as a poet, and, I, and the whole session was on literary arts. Some of you may have been there, yes. Um, so, um, yeah, I seem to be more, inter more interested in that cross-disciplinary conversation. So even though I know it's difficult, then perhaps it will be unfamiliar to you, but let, I'm gonna just tell you a little bit about what I do, not going into any details in, in my scientific work. Um, and what I've been working on over the past 10 years is uh, something that we call 
coupled human environment systems, that's the term that uh, we are using in our small field of people working on this. And I'm just going to explain a little bit what that is and how we go about doing it. So, a few years ago, probably about 15 years ago, I I'm an ecologist, I am a scientist, this is my training, and um, what, what that means is that uh, I'm steeped in the language and culture of science, scientific method, Western science I'm talking about here, and um, it's very disciplinary, it's very siloed, and you know, so much so that uh, it's quite difficult to insert oneself or to acknowledge sort of the subjective and human uh, aspects of, of the systems that we're working on. I mean, we recognize as ecologists that humans impact these systems. That's kind of a lot of what we study, right, is the response of these systems to, to, to human um, activity. Um, but we generally see these as two different systems, and the social scientists and then, you know, various other people work on one side and scientists work on one side and, you know, very little overlap. And I'm not suggesting I'm the only one who has these ideas or thoughts, for sure, there's, there's a group, but um, we've been making some headway in this area. So, um, and so just broadly speaking, like, environmental dynamics is studied by a set of tools and theories and models by scientists, ecologists, biogeochemists, climate scientists, etc., etc., and we, this is the language of our, our work, right? We, we look at, um, you know, models of multi-species, we study thresholds, we look at biogeophysical dynamics, and humans are often really just, if they're in it, it's like, we're just looking at the response after the fact. We're still only dealing with non-human aspects, abiotic and non-human species, um, when we're modeling the systems. Um, of course, there, um, and, and it's complex, it's extremely complex and difficult to do, and much needs to be still learned about these systems. Uh, but on the other side, you know, there are human systems which, you know, have its own, you know, humans is, we're, we're a different species, right? We're different, we have, um, we're not, we have a lot in common <laughs> with uh, uh, other species, uh, but as we know, because of where we are at in this emergency, there's a disproportionate, uh, you know, um, amount of, of impact and effect that the human species has on our, our, on our environment and on other species. So, um, but there are aspects of human dynamics, which of course exist in other species too, but um, are very dominant in the human species, of, that, like social learning, uh, how we learn from each other, uh, how we value systems, and how we analyze things. Uh, you know, humans are not completely rational in their behavior, uh, and we, you know, the e economists think we are, uh, social scientists and philosophers and so many others realize that we're not, and we're still trying to uh, bring that knowledge into our economic systems, into our value systems, into the, uh, you know, yeah, how we value ecosystems and, and their services. So, generally speaking, those two things happen separately, but what I have been doing in my research for the past 15, you know, since I had this realization that, you know, very little of what we have studied and presented to society as scientists and ecologists has been taken up by society. And, um, you know, it was just felt, and the urgency of, of doing so felt so strong. Even 10 years ago, even 15 years ago, when, you know, the first targets were put out by the IPCC and um, um, the, the COP meetings for biodiversity targets and so on. I had the realization while teaching an undergraduate course in forest, current issues in forest science, and I thought, you know, you know, it, we need to study these interacting systems more. Oh, what is that one minute? Oh god. Okay, well, we couple these systems. We try to determine behaviors and identify some of these aspects so that we can um, so for example, the idea that things become valuable when they're rare is a very 
human thing, and all of our species, um, all of our legislation around protecting things revolves around that. It's an extremely simple but powerful thing. Um, of course, you know, we need to reconsider what we mean by economic benefits, and even things like risk per perception are things that you can, um, that really can have a, a profound impact on how humans interact with environmental systems. Um, there's this other thing that we really need to be able to change called social norms, uh, and it's very difficult to change, but we can model those things, and that's, that's something that we are, you know, we cannot really change our societies without changing the social norms. We, we put those into our models. Um, and so, the, and the idea is that by including those aspects, we can create a positive, a negative feedback loop between these two different systems. And that, that those changing, changing those ways that we uh, value, perceive, aestheticize, etc., cetera, um, our environment, um, will then lead to things like harvesting protection, changes in harvesting patterns, protection of environment restoration and mitigation. Um, I guess I'll just stop there <laughs> because um, did you tell me from the very beginning I just <laughs> my uh, This poem is a is a is found from one of my own scientific articles. All the words in it occur in the scientific article. Forward, backward procedure. Because we simply do not have enough information a priori. Because no sequence is emitted, no conservative lower bound. Because the annual cycling might represent a recurring disturbance. Because well-known abilities can be masked. We have no framework for dealing with the shortcomings, the curve as it approaches zero. There are four problems that must be solved. Drought, power, psychology, and light. <laughs> How many states should the final model have? So it's taken from a, a paper that we published in 2005 entitled On the Use of Stationary versus Hidden Markov Models to Detect Simple versus Complex Ecological Dynamics. So thank you.
And there I met Washo, who um, was the first uh, chimpanzee to acquire American Sign Language. And um, I believe she was a poet, too. <laughs> um, uh, she invented words by combining two signs together. So, you know, the word for swan was water bird, the word for watermelon was candy drink, um, and then going to the potty was dirty good. <laughs> um, um, but, you know, also, like a poet, she had a profound sense of, of loss and grief. Um, she was ripped from her family um, in Africa and brought to the U.S. for the space program and then rerouted to these language experiments. But it was at CHCI that I met um, scientists like Roger Fouts who um, were grappling with this long-term ethical implication about the use of animals in research, um, advocating for its end, and asking the question, how do we repair the harm we've caused um, these other species? Um, but it was my um, engineering skills that uh, opened the doors for me to volunteer at a chimpanzee sanctuary in Cameroon. Um, they needed help with water and drainage issues, um, but in the process, I became a foster mother to uh, three newly arrived baby orphanages um, who had lost their mothers to the illegal bushmeat trade. Um, their habitats were also being destroyed by logging, and the logging industry was sort of creating these conduits and pathways into their vulnerable habitats, which enabled sort of more people with trees and people with mothers, um, and that's sort of the special little forest without its elders. So, you know, I was thinking a lot about how we reimagine our relationship with these other beings with whom we share our own world. Um, that led to, this experience really led to the publication of my very first article almost 20 years ago um, for this activist magazine called Sophia, which was truth in Sanskrit. Um, it later became one of its editors, and what I loved about the magazine was that um, it really understood that the advocacy was intimately connected to environmentalism and social justice. And um, each month we sort of were confronting some of the most pressing planetary issues, um, but posing the question, you know, what do we do with what we know? How do we invoke change in ourselves and in our communities? And how do we sit with this sort of massive scale of planetary sorrow and emerge with truth and compassion as our guides instead of despair? And you know, one of these areas that we were exploring was the environmental harm associated with our industrialized factory farms um, drawn by us globally. And I was working with um, a public policy tech, Ryder Green, to document some of these conditions in India and how they're also tied to multiple crises, including climate change and zoonotic diseases. And you know, this question of like how do we avoid um, exacerbating these crises and can we disentangle ourselves from these systems of harm. <clears throat> and um, lately I've been turning to what remains of uh, the poetry of the ancient Tamil Sangha, who I know from her scanners and they very closely with. Um, and they are possibly, you know, the very first people poets. Um, their uh, early literature was, was lost to the sea. Um, their poems and their poems were, were swallowed by the sea twice. And um, in what has been recovered, uh, we learned how closely they paid attention to seasons and landscapes, how they talked about the, the gifts of rain, how they considered shade as kin to kindness, and how they noticed animal joy and distress. Their poems are classified into a common form, inness and outness, um, but in, in, in many ways are also linking the two. And that's sort of, you know, really where, what I'm interested in, um, at how they connect personal planetary grief. And in the problem of we're doing is the word for truth may is the same as the word for body. You know, the truth is in the body. Last slide. Um, I wanted to close by telling you about my recent collaboration with the local block artist here, Lisa Hermer, um, on a poetic infrastructure installation at the Toronto waterfront, um, where the mouth of the Don River is currently being reconstructed. Um, I appreciate this opportunity to think about infrastructure, not through a technical lens, but through a more philosophical, poetic one, um, as the underlying framework of a society. And I was telling Lisa this project reminded me of um, my namesakes and my first father, King Ashoka, who um, sprinkled rock edicts all over India that etched into stone a sort of framework for how to transform an empire that he acquired through violence and transformed you know, into a one that's governed by nonviolence. Um, and what a celebration when we realize that our survival need not make us into monsters. 
and I'm invoking um, the brilliant writer Alexis Pauling Gums here as well. Um, I wanted my little um, infrastructure in it uh, to be such a celebration and an invitation for mutual flourishing. So we have a gather love free. All species welcome. Where, where is that? It's at the Toronto Waterfront. Um, it's at Aiken Place Park. Um, I'm hoping to go there tomorrow on my way out, so I'm really excited to, to go there. Um, and there's, there's four of them um, with a couple of other local artists here. So it's, it's kind of nice that they're doing a really great um, whole project to restore the mouth of the river and do a bunch of habitat restorations. So it's quite impressive. Thank you. first two presentations. <laughs> so I'll start by introducing myself as Steffi Cairns. Um, I'm a visiting um, Knowledge Exchange Chair at the University of Guelph, uh, the Kinross Chair in Environmental Governance. And my mandate is to bring a practitioner or real world perspective to the work of Guelph faculty and students. You might say that I bring a defiantly policy bomb and intersectoral dimension to this discussion on interdisciplinary environmental research, and that I'm firmly embedded in the red and the blue um, dimensions of your interdisciplinary diagram here. I'm usually based in Victoria, BC, and I've been working for over 30 years with NGOs, think tanks, and governments on topics of climate policy, the low carbon energy transition, circular economy, and nature protection. So I'm going to open by quoting Greta Thunberg and her clarion call to listen to the science, which I'm sure resonated with so many of us. She's possibly the most famous teenager on the planet, and she points with incredible, incredible conviction to the destabilizing of climate patterns, to weather systems that are increasingly seen to be on steroids, and is imploring us to listen to the science. But my challenge back is, which science? by which I am by no means met backing those skeptics whose question the natural science behind these forecasts, but I'm flagging that a broad spectrum of the social sciences are just as important to listen to, if we are to find the formula for the robust and sticky solutions to tackle such daunting crises. That is, policies and approaches which are resilient to political winds, which are accepted and embraced by our, um, our populations, our um, voters, and yet are still potent. And I think this resonates with, with many of the points which uh, I've already made. So I wanted to give two examples to illustrate this. First, an example from my own experience with carbon pricing. Some 30 years ago, when I worked at Alberta's Pembina Institute, we adopted what was at the time a very audacious an unusual interdisciplinary approach within the environmental sector by integrating economic theory into our environmental activism. We formed a number of NGO industry collaboratives to explore and socialize the concept of carbon pricing in the oil patch. It seemed like a very ready sell, a policy tool which could combine environmental effectiveness, economic efficiency, conservative fiscal principles, and response flexibility. And with over a decade of solid groundwork by a growing array of organizations, by 2007, a strong enough consensus within the policy walk community was being shaped to allow for carbon pricing systems to be introduced in four provinces, albeit these were different models and rigor. But then economic theory collided with reality. And those included management sciences and behavioral sciences, because it turned out that businesses, institutions, and consumers did not respond with the expected economically rational choices that our echo chamber of economists had anticipated. And um, the experiment also collided with political science, as right-leaning leaders not only abandoned the conservative economics of carbon pricing, which we had expected them to you know, support, um, 
but abandon them for the promise of much less economically efficient, therefore much, much more fiscally expensive subsidies and regulations, and also leverage that opposition to rally populist anti-carbon tax movements. So for the time being, the federal backstop is still holding the carbon price as the backbone of Canadian carbon policy. But what wonders how long this can hold. Across the border, the game-changing U.S. Inflation Reduction Act has just been adopted, snatched from the jaws of defeat only through intense negotiations between the Democrats and their own right-leaning Senator Joe Manchin. It has gone whole hog on a subsidy model, dedicating U.S. $369 billion to direct investments and tax credits for clean energy. Canada's clean tech sector is already panicking that these incentives are already beginning to suck green talent and investment capital to the U.S., leaving Canada in the wake. So how long will we be able to afford to stick to the purest economic theory of carbon taxes? In this example, early promoters of carbon pricing were working largely in that echo chamber made up of a single disciplinary economic lens. We had not taken a sufficiently interdisciplinary approach to understanding the broader landscape within which those policies would be received. Indeed, I'd argue that including more interdisciplinary perspectives would have been considered flaky in many of the meetings that I was in. My second example anticipates the future. If we ask even well-informed Canadians what is our greatest decarbonization challenge, most would point to the oil sands. Yet an equally gnarly challenge lies with the massive growth in clean electricity production, distribution, and transmission that is required to meet the anticipated escalation in demand as transportations, buildings, manufacturing, and heavy industry electrify as their key strategy for net zero. A growing array of think tanks, from the Canadian Climate Institute to the Trottier Institute to even the Royal Bank of Canada, are highlighting this. RBC projects a 50% increase in demand within the next decade alone, while the Climate Institute claims our clean electricity generation capacity will need to be two and a half to three and a half times larger by 2050 than it is today. And this growth is above and beyond the need to decarbonize the last 20% of the power grid. If ever there was a need for interdisciplinary collaboration and intersectoral collaboration to identify robust and sticky solutions to a real world challenge, this is it. How can this critical challenge be addressed not simply as an engineering and economic question? Nothing at this pace or scale or investment has been attempted in the electricity sector, a sector that in most parts of the country can best be described as risk adverse, ponderous, and heavily regulated. So I have more comments, but my time is up, but I'll come back to this, today's question. And my answer to today's question would be that um, how would you like to work between disciplines to discover new truths about the environment and our relationships to it? My answer would be by creating the safe space and dialogue skills to generate deeply challenging insights from interdisciplinary and intersectoral conversations that are needed to inform the design of net zero transition policies that can be both robust and sticky. Thanks. Hi, everybody. I'm Catherine Bush. I'm a novelist, writer, associate professor of creative writing here at the University of Guelph. Um, I live on Treaty 13 and Treaty 57 territory in Toronto and in eastern Ontario. So one of the current focuses of my work is how we can use imagination and imaginative practices in our response to the climate crisis, which, as we've already heard discussed, is often seen as a crisis of science, of environment, um, a, a dilemma that demands a scientific or technological response, so we've had the conversation expanded beyond that this morning, and I too want to consider it as a human crisis demanding human change. And central to this, um, as it is central to my practice, is our need for new stories, 
new myths, new conceptualizing, new ways of seeing ourselves, and a recognition that the words we use to describe these things matter. So a choice of words matters. And I've approached these questions as a creative artist, as a collaborative researcher here at the University of Guelph, and as a teacher in the classroom, both graduate and undergraduate creative writing. Fundamental to all these approaches is the question of how we pay attention to the world we live in and that we are part of. So the question is an aesthetic, ethical, and epistemological one. And I'm always taken back in my process to something that I learned very early um, from the American uh, naturalist and ecologist, Mary Lopez, um, who I had the great fortune to assist um, in a teaching context one summer. And he was talking about the etymological relation between attention and tender in the Latin verb tendra, to reach, to stretch towards. So not an act of grasping, as one would grasp an object, but are reaching out to a potential other with the possibility of reciprocity, and how tenderness in our noticings of the world was an essential um, and necessary approach. As a writer of fiction, I've approached these questions by writing about scientists, most recently a climate scientist, Alan Wells, who's also a father, as seen by his daughter Miranda in my novel Blaze Island, published in 2020. Very quickly, for some visuals, there's the cover by this amazing Newfoundland artist, Christine Koch. Um, and I'm now embarked on a new novel um, about a mid 20th century scientist and nature writer whose work combines lyricism with scientific knowledge. Might sound like a scientist and a writer who you know. And yes, indeed, my fictional character draws overtly on the life of Rachel Carson, Carson who has been much written about, but not much written about in fiction. So, in looking back to that post Second World War period, I want to write into the break between believing that there was an extraordinary, wondrous natural world beyond the reach of the human to recognizing the reach of human power and potential for destruction, and that this reach is, was and is global, biospheric, atmospheric, oceanic. What does it feel like to cross that epistemological divide, to be alive in it, alive to it? As a novelist, I want to bring different modes of thinking together and to make a mess, upset notions of the objective, break down binaries, such as science, art, nature, human. I need to acknowledge my own hesitations about the word environment, or at least the way it's often used. Um, we speak about the environmental movement being here, the rest of the world over there. So there's a kind of ghettoizing or fence making that comes into force. I, at the same time, I want to acknowledge its etymology, since I love the generative and regenerative palimpsests of etymologies. So, environment comes from environ, environ, from the French to encircle, to surround. I will admit the word I prefer is ecology. I yearn to engage in and provoke, promote ecological thinking, thinking and imagining our connections, our connectivity, kin, care, kinship relations that extend through and beyond the human to all the life that lives beyond us. So we are the environment, we encircle and surround as we are encircled and surrounded, but we are not alone in the environment or being the environment. We are one part of its porousness and interconnectivity. I wish we recognized the old meanings when air was not just air but spirit, when breath was physical and metaphysical, when the atmosphere was inside us and outside us. To aspire was and is to be and to dream of, to dream towards. North American indigenous languages still hold these ways of being together. It's no coincidence that aspiration means both hope and the act of breathing, says the parrot in Ted Chang's The Great Silence, a very short and memorable story about possibility, love, extinction, and listening to each other across species boundaries. Similarly, as a creative writer who writes about scientists, I want to bring thinking about science and scientists out of the realm of the documentary and the fact base. I want to acknowledge the uncertainty of scientific processes, the best part of the uncertain that is the search and research, the inquiry, also the emotion that drives scientific inquiry, the desire, the fear, the eros, the psychological need, and the human fallibility that causes us to see 
only what we want to see and fail to see or listen to what doesn't fit. As an essayist, I've written recently about my relationship as a child, as child of immigrants to North America with invasive plant species, particularly those from Europe, non-native species that create monocultures here, and about how to navigate our relationship to land, here on the land where I was born, which nevertheless is not mine, um, nor the land of my ancestors, but stolen land. And a very brief um, visual from this piece, which um, is an extraordinary illustration from Emergence magazine. And I'm just going to finish my thoughts here. Um, and this spring, I wrote about using the relationship of aunt rather than mother or parent when it comes to thinking about land love, pointing to the intrinsic altruism of the aunt relationship that fundamental to it is love and care for those who are not your own, but others' children. Um, I've considered how we might use that altruistic auntie's impulse to care in other contexts, ecologically, when thinking about land, the rest of the living world, and how ant care and the verb to ant, which doesn't exist but should, is particularly conceptually useful to us now. What could a science, not just an art rooted in tenderness and care, look like? What is the science of tenderness? Discipline is a strange word, rooted in instruction and knowledge, but associated with obeying, rigor, punishment, even mortification. What if we reimagine disciplines as zones of care? How can we all, in our interpenetrated, interwoven, interwoven ecological zones, go forth as carers and be tender and attentive aspirational and transformative all at the same time. Be good aunties. Thank you. Thank you. Here sharing this space with you and thank you to Madur um, for, uh, for her collaboratory. I love that word. Has that word been used yet? The collaboratory, right? The collaboratory. It's a great word in neologism. Um, and you know, this kind of the laboratory and the collaboration coming together across all of these fields, which is really um, at the heart of my own practice as a poet. Um, I'm a poet, I'm an associate professor of English, and I teach creative writing at Wake Forest University in North Carolina. And I want to start by um, presenting a word that Charles Bernstein presented at um, Wake Forest not, uh, just two days ago when he was a visitor. Um, the word is disorientation, and he spelled it D-Y-S, disorientation, disorientation. So I want to start with the idea of disorienting the word environment. Um, I came to um, thinking about uh, my own poetic practice and poetics in general through the lens of science by disorienting and, um, as a result, sort of defamiliarizing um, the, the concept of environment um, in, in my thinking. And the way I arrived to that was, was through thinking about um, environment, um, not from the mesocosmic scale, the scale um, that also might be called the Newtonian scale, um, the scale of the normative, the scale of the habituated mind, the scale of consensus reality. Um, but instead through two other scales, um, and these are scientific scales, the scales of the subatomic, so environment at the scale of the subatomic scale, at the scale of quantum physics, and then the scale of the cosmological, so the scale of relativity. And when I, when I disoriented um, the, concept of, the concept of environment, through these scales, I began to think about um, the possibilities of, of what poetry is, of what language itself is. Of course, language um, is often used at the mesocosmic scale, at the Newtonian scale, as a way to communicate, um, as a way to transact. Um, it's often used without form. But, it's, it, but through, the, through, um, through poetry, um, through both the formal and um, philosophical innovations that are possible in poetry, poetry being a very anarchistic form of language, a nimble form of language, um, where anything can happen. Um, through the context of poetry, uh, um, you know, um, anything is possible. And 
thinking itself and language itself gets translated, um, gets translated in a way where um, you know possibilities are glimpsed that could not be otherwise. And so it, it was really um, through what that led me to as a poet was to you know begin to collaborate. Um, with scientists and to um, write poems, not just talking about science, but also modeling and formally innovating at the scale of scientific methodologies. Uh, and I began to focus and specialize in two areas, um, particle physics and astrophysics. So uh, both of those rhyme with what I was just talking about earlier about the, about the subatomic and the cosmological. So particle physics, um, as many of you know, um, is the study of um, physical reality at the, at the quantum scale, um, below the atom, below the scale of the atom. And then, of course, um, astrophysics is um, often married to cosmology and other kinds of you know, astronomy, but is, uh, is really interested in, in thinking about um, cosmological scales of space-time. And so some of, um, some of this experimentation, and I think of it as a kind of investigative poetics. Um, I'm investigating. I don't have predetermined answers. I'm very interested in accuracy, working with accurate notions of science. I'm not interested in um, reducing um, all of my encounters to a predetermined a priori notion of mysticism. I'm, I'm not opposed to mysticism, but I'm not moving toward it. And um, I take a very relativistic um, and contextual approach to each project um, so that each one can lead me into new areas of knowledge, of understanding, of experience, and ultimately of poetics. Um, so I, I, I want to just briefly speak about a couple of the projects I've been a part of, and then I'll end with a short excerpt of a poem. Um, some of my investigations have led me, one investigation led me to um, the Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory in Chile. Um, where I worked with the Dark Energy Survey. Um, these, were astro these are astrophysicists who are mapping, creating a, a, a detailed 3D map of the cosmos in order to understand dark energy. Um, very briefly, dark energy is a, they don't know if it's a force, a field, a new particle of matter, but it is a phenomenon um, that basically invert, it, 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 um, it's sort of like the opposite of gravity. It's a repulsive gravity. So gravity brings things together, at least at the scale of Earth. Um, and in, the, in galactic scales, um, dark energy is a force or particle or, or phenomena that pushes matter apart. And it's really very important to the evolution of the universe because essentially the scientists believe that the universe um, um, was evolved. It, it evolved. The ecology of the universe itself evolved through dark energy pushing um, clusters of matter apart, which created space-time. Um, I've also worked um, at the Simon Center for Physics and Geometry um, at Stony Brook University, where I developed um, a poem based on a topological quantum computer. So I took the form of this computer and I mapped out a poem on top of the model. Um, and as a result, its, its aim is to not just sort of talk about or explain what quantum theory is, but to be a quantum system. Um, there are actually 96 poems inside that poem, um, a number that a computer scientist who I've been working with um, uh, calculated based on some artificial intelligence um, technology that he used to create a new quantum script for the poem. And then lastly, um, the last, the last, um, yeah, the last project I just mentioned are my collaborations um, with particle physicists at CERN in Switzerland. Um, and I'm working particularly with a, with a um, particle physicist named James Beecham, and we're interested in exploring the concept of the Planck link, which um, is a very deep scale um, of reality where, uh, where if, if we were able to access it through a particle accelerator like the Large Hadron Collider, we would be able to understand um, you know, all open questions that scientists have about the universe. So I'm just going to end on very quickly on just, a, a, just the beginning of a, of a long poem that explores um, the plant life. It's called Resonance. Before and beneath the Planck length, at LP 10 to the minus 43, at the energy frontier of physics and poetry, where collisions occur at the highest luminosities, where the distance between the subatomic and the cosmological dissolves like the distance between sound and song, 
where the theory of gravity and geometries of space-time fail, where the laws of science and language no longer apply, where words decay into poems so they resound. There is a setting where the universe contains nothing but its definition, which is everything it can be. Hi everyone, my name is Amanda Butskis. Um, I'm an art historian specializing in ecology and theories of consciousness, perception, and representation across disciplines. Uh, my research analyzes uh, complex human relationships to the environment through the lens of aesthetics, uh, patterns of human waste, uh, and the global energy economy. Um, I'm the author of uh, uh, a few monographs, The Ethics of Earth Art, uh, Plastic Capitalism, Contemporary Art and Drive to Waste, uh, a forthcoming uh, book called Ecologicity, Vision, uh, uh, and the Planetarity of Art, uh, and a co-editor of Heidegger and the Work of Art History, Artworks for Jellyfish and Other Others, and Art's Realism in the Post-Truth Era. Since 2016, uh, I've been researching environments in the circumpolar north, addressing the Greenland ice sheet as a primary site of environmental, social, political, and mediatic importance. In 2019, uh, after several uh, fieldwork expeditions to Greenland, I held an interdisciplinary site-specific workshop entitled At the Moraine, envisioning the concerns of ice in Ululisat, uh, a township of uh, 4,000 people. Ilulisat is a critically important region to which scientists come from around the world to measure the activity of Arctic ice and refine climate change modeling through everything from remote satellite imaging uh, to measuring the surface mass balance of the ice, animal migration, uh, the formation of sea ice, and so forth. The Ilulisat ice fjord is also cited in the world's largest sovereign indigenous territory. So the ambition of the workshop was to connect uh, knowledge of environmental science and its mediations of vision with Inuit epistemology and the politics of sovereignty and to develop an aesthetic sensibility for this reciprocal form of relating. This was more than a workshop though. I thought of it as a microcosm of a political ecology, a sphere of exchange not only between epistemological standpoints but also across modes of existence and one that was geared toward mediations of environmental phenomena and perceptions of environment. It was performative, speculative, factual, and collaborative all at once. Um, I would like to claim uh, that all these modalities, in combination and in conflict, drive at an interdisciplinary access uh, by which to renew thinking about climate change. I call this axis a transit, which is a term the indigenous scholar Jody Bird calls uh, the site between histories and spaces that destabilize any singular cultural standpoint. My ambition was that the transit would be instigated by the material positioning of the site, the moraine. Moraine is the geological debris left behind uh, as glacier ice crushes the rock beneath it, leaving everything from a fine mineral rich silt to corridors of erratic boulders. Moraine is replete with the geological evidence of colliding human, cultural, and earthly forces, a kind of dialectical opposite to an ice core specimen. I chose to situate the event at the moraine of the Lulisat Ice Fjord in order to consider the ecology of West Greenland where uh, glacier ice melts and withdraws leaving a host of political and cultural conflicts in its wake. As well, I wanted to disjoin the study of ice uh, from the prevailing imagery that is fraught with the colonial imaginary of the Arctic as a pristine and vulnerable landscape. Um, what we're looking at here is a performance by the Greenlandic artist Jesse Kleeman. The performance took place on the ice sheet. Since then, the film of the performance uh, and the performance was actually recorded by, uh, by one of uh, my graduate students, Chelsea Reed, who is Anishinaabe. Uh, the film of the performance has exhibited at the inaugural exhibition of the Inuit Art Center in Winnipeg, Inua, 
uh, an exhibition called Exposure, Native Art and Political Ecology uh, at the MOCNA in San Fe, and a touring exhibition. Uh, an exhibition called Worst Case Scenario for Artists from Greenland um, at the Lunds Kunsthalle Sweden. And it will appear next year at the National Museum of Denmark in uh, uh, Copenhagen. So I'm also invested in the notion of envisioning, envisioning as part of the procedure of collective thinking and the collective mediation of that process. Uh, the task of the project is not to compare disciplinary and culturally specific images, which would be a kind of sadistic application of scientific, uh, posit scientific positivism over the political imperatives at stake in knowledge sharing itself, but to actually experiment with modes of collaborative envisioning while bearing in mind that collaboration is a notion with utopian desires and dystopian effects that can unfold unevenly across disciplines. The upcoming site of consideration, sorry, I think there was a gesture in there. Okay, the upcoming site of consideration for At the Moraine um, in the next few years is a proposed uranium mine in Narsak uh, in southwest Greenland. The next four years are a crucial period um, uh, over the course of which a highly politicized and potentially devastating environmental situation uh, is taking place. Narsak is a town of a few hundred people and is the site of one of the world's largest uranium deposits. Many multinationals have their eye on this deposit, um, and one in particular, uh, an Australian company called Greenland Minerals Limited has been sampling and mapping this deposit since 2007. Yet resistance on the part of Greenlandic Inuit and particularly grassroots organization called Yurani Namik has been overwhelmingly successful. Last November, a week before I went to Narsak for field research, the parliament passed a five-year uranium mining ban. Not long after, however, the mining company took the governments of Greenland and Denmark into litigation. They are claiming that they have the right to safeguard their investment because they have already conducted research there. So the law regarding Greenland's claims to its own land are being challenged from outside its borders and by a mining company. The clock is ticking on the uranium ban. The publicity about this deposit in Narsak never mentions uranium. It is entirely focused on rare earth minerals, all the mineral deposits that surround uranium, and which are purportedly necessary for all our media devices. U.S. company called Cobold, backed by Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates, is seeking to surveil the site using artificial intelligence. The discourses and technologies that are enveloping the township of Narsak obscure the fact that the proposal on the table is an open pit uranium mine, not so different from the kinds of uranium mines that we've seen across the circumpolar north since the Cold War. And this would devastate the area environmentally, and possibly the entire peninsula of southwest Greenland. So at the Moraine is considering West Greenland as a pivotal site for theorizing global energy transition from oil to nuclear energy. The visual languages of resource mining and artificial intelligence, environmental justice and indigenous activism, and how these are transforming the global picture of the planet as this appears in contemporary art worlds, certainly, but also in interdisciplinary worlds, as scientists and humanists alike develop new practices of just envisioning and just research by which to tackle global environmental challenges, their effects on lives, livelihoods, and experience. So what I want to suggest to you is that a theorization of perspective and mediated perception that is thought through this environmental situation and others like it is what is needed in order to recapitulate the value of research across the sciences, humanities, and the politics of technological development. Day. What kinds of subjectivities need to be forged, human and non-human, that can respond to this crisis? What new aesthetic forms need to be invented? Ecology is a problem of writing, 
as philosopher Bruno Latour notes, because it's founded on the incapacity to describe the space where we're living, the earth, and to write that space we inhabit. Scientists, as, um, as has been noted uh, this morning, have been feeding us the facts of ecological collapse for most of our lives. And yet the facts alone haven't been persuasive enough for us to make the kind of changes that we need to make. Perhaps sociological, scientific, and journalistic language for dealing with this crisis has been insufficient. If so, maybe literature, even poetry, has a role to play. But really, can poetry resensitize us to a better understanding of our place in the world? Can it help rewrite history and rewire our consciousness? As globalization draws us together and industrialization and human population pressures take their tolls on natural habitats and as species of plants and animals flicker out and are snuffed from the earth, it's worthwhile to ask whether an ethnocentric view of human species, as a, of human beings as a species independent from others, underpins our exploitation of natural resources, as Amanda was just talking about, and sets into motion these dire consequences. Because what we've perpetrated on our environment has certainly affected a writer's means and material. But can poetry be ecological? Can it display or be invested with values that acknowledge the economy of interrelationship between human and non-human realms? Aside from issues of theme and reference, how might syntax or line break or the shape of the poem on the page express an ethological, ecological ethics? If our perceptual experience is mostly palimpsestic and endlessly juxtaposed and fragmented, if events rarely have discrete beginnings or endings, but only layers, duration, and transitions, if natural processes are, as we know, already altered by and responsive to human observation, how could poetry register that complex interdependency that draws us into a dialogue with the world? I forgot to introduce myself. <laughs> <laughs> My name's Forrest Gander. I have degrees in geology and, uh, and literature, and I'm a writer and a translator. Of course, there are long traditions of the pastoral, poetry centered on nature and landscape in both Eastern and Western traditions. I myself am less interested in nature poetry, where nature features merely as a theme, than in poetry, sometimes called eco-poetry, that investigates, both thematically and formally, the relationship between nature and culture, language and perception. Um, this is, uh, something that Sangamitha was talking about earlier this morning. I'm not going to propose, of course, that there's any way of writing that gets it right, that enacts some kind of union between linguistic meaning and phenomenal reality. Compost is no more a model of nature than geometrical symmetry, a housefly's eye, or strict mathematical progression, the Fibonacci number sequence. It depends upon how we might want to metaphorize nature and no definition is going to be authoritative. A strict Petrarchan sonnet might as readily suggest to a reader the rigid imposition of an authorial control as the humbling sublimation of a writer's choices to a larger, because conventional, expressive pattern. Maybe the development of environmental literacy, by which I mean a capacity for reading connections between the environment and its inhabitants, can be promoted by poetic literacy. Maybe poetic literacy will be deepened through environmental literacy, because poetry doesn't simply supplement the, ra the rational intellect, but provides inherently and sometimes incommensurable forms of insight, because its meanings are neither quantitative or verifiable. Poetry may offer different, subtler, and more complex expressions than the language of information, transaction, and commerce. If language does both reflect and affect the way we think about being in the world, poetry can make something happen. I would suggest it does, but it probably doesn't affect perception nearly as directly as poets might wish. 
getting rid of the capital I, eliminating pronouns altogether, deconstructing normative syntax, making the word wordy, etc. These techniques, all more than 100 years old, impact the reader, but the effects are complex and subtle and may not correspond to a writer's intentions at all. Perhaps, instead of taking responsibility for modeling ecologies, poems take responsibility for certain ways of thinking and writing. By inviting audiences to see what powers they take on as they adapt themselves to how the texts ask to be read. What if the structures of perception are not subjective or objective, but are articulated inside a media of relation and interaction such that to speak is to surge up into a medium that isn't projected, but is ongoing like an environment. Might we see them ourselves then as participants in a non-instrumental language? Would there be any way to know for sure? Thanks. I think uh, before COVID, um, that wasn't a term that most people knew, but I'm sure it's uh, now familiar to all of you what my discipline is. So, real pleasure to be here. It's been um, wonderful, actually, listening to the speakers uh, this morning. You, most of you are kind of in a world that I, I do not occupy, and so it's been wonderful, actually, listening to you and thinking about um, the ways that you're approaching the environment from a very uh, different perspective than how I think about things. So um, it's just been really excellent. I'm so, so glad to be here. Okay, the next slide, please. So um, as in my discipline, as an epidemiologist, I like to uh, use data to try and uh, answer questions. And uh, specifically, my lab focuses on how we can uh, think about how One Health outcomes or environments are impacted by um, the ways in which social or natural or built environments are constructed. And specifically, I like to think about how those represent uh, risk factors for uh, the opportunity for people to uh, get sick and or to uh, use health resources. And so, that's kind of the overarching goal of my lab, and I think about this for both um, animal and uh, human populations. So the next slide, thanks. So uh, One Health itself um, is a very interdisciplinary uh, concept, and if you're from the University of Guelph, you're probably uh, quite familiar with uh, One Health, and, and perhaps from elsewhere, I'm not sure. Um, so I wanted to give sort of a brief overview of what One Health is. It's really the notion that um, humans, animals, and the environment are all interconnected. And more recently, the notion of the environment was really expanded to not only think about our natural environment, but also the other environments that we occupy, um, including our built environments, our social environments, our political environments and how all of those uh, sort of interact with um, animals and with humans to create opportunities um, for health. Uh, next slide, thank you. So when I try to come at this from an epidemiological perspective, I like to think about um, well, where I can access data and how I can use that data to inform uh, questions about One Health and how that um, influences our own health as humans, how that influences uh, animal health and environmental health. And historically, when you try and come at this from an interdisciplinary perspective, it's been quite difficult because these data tend to be um, siloed and or inaccessible across disciplines. And so 
Um, historically, sort of social data has occupied kind of one disciplinary area. Environmental data has occupied another area. And human health data has occupied a different area. And it has been uh, difficult to mesh those together. Um, but the power of being able to do that is, um, is quite important because it allows you to ask different questions and to think about all of these um, broader influences on health um, from different perspectives. Next slide. So one of the ways that we can try and think about how these broader environments influence health is by actually just using your address. Uh, so using your postal code to um, link together information about the environments that you occupy, whether that's um, social information, um, so that would be things like um, median household income, um, the demographics of the neighborhood that you occupy, your access to food environments or access to resources, um, environmental information, so we can now access things um, about sort of the natural environments that you occupy, uh, the built environments that you occupy, all of that we can derive um, just from your postal code. And we can now start to link that to um, health information to ask questions about how exactly do your neighborhoods influence your health, whether that's your social neighborhood, your political neighborhood, your um, natural neighborhoods, the composition of your neighborhood, um, how does that influence different health outcomes? So that's sort of one approach that um, we take in my lab. The second approach is that um, there's actually been a lot of work uh, done by Statistics Canada to uh, link information at the individual level. So now we actually have one minute, okay. Now we actually have um, uh, health information. So that uh, takes the form of things like hospital records, um, OHIP billing accounts, uh, pharmacy information. And that has now been linked to social data that exists um, and things like population census information and that sort of thing to allow us to ask new questions um, across disciplines. Um, I'll just skip this part, mostly just to say that we can also then link to um, additional environmental information to get a more holistic picture of influences on health. Okay, perfect. So this led me to um, propose a project that's been funded um, by GEAR, and I'm actually working with uh, Karen O'Doherty, who I think is speaking a little bit later, um, and Andy Papadopoulos, and a couple of uh, master's students, Sam McCreevy, and uh, Grant Hogan to ask about how um, inequities in uh, social and environmental uh, risk factors influence the risk of foodborne and waterborne diseases in Canada. So historically, this has been very difficult to um, analyze because the data that you need to ask that question has often existed in silos. But as I just mentioned, we now have the opportunity to bring those data sources together. So here we're really asking about whether uh, the risk of disease is borne by uh, certain groups over others. So for example, um, many of you might be familiar with um, sort of the uh, contamination of, of water sources on indigenous reserves. And so we can ask questions about how um, indigenous status might put people at risk of these diseases over others. Um, and so we're starting off with a scoping review of the literature to examine the extent of evidence that exists, and then using that review to engage uh, stakeholders in both the health equity and um, food and waterborne disease space to then uh, propose new research areas and new questions that we can explore. I think that's my last slide. So thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, speak with you this morning. I would actually, you know, I don't know if that you know, has prompted ideas for you as artists and writers. Again, it's not my area, but 
If it has, um, I would love to hear it and think about ways that we might explore um, health equity from your disciplinary perspectives um, because it's not the way that I think. So I would love to hear actually if, uh, if it prompted any or sparked any ideas, I would love to uh, connect with you uh, by email. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> Okay, hi everybody. You're so well known that I, um, you're so well known that I had to correct someone's pronunciation of your last name. All right. <laughs> you see what I mean? I get it. Uh, mon, mon nom c'est Karen Hull. Ma, mon français, ma, oui, so it's that's Karen Hull. So if you're English, you can call me Hull. If you're French, you can call me Hull. Um, so I, what I do now, spend most of my every day um, designing and building community compost systems. I am recently retired from full professorship in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Guelph. And um, so it's important for me to uh, tell you that because what I want to talk about today is the significance or the possible generativeness of having a very critical or fragile or uncomfortable relationship to one's discipline. So, um, but that's not just something out there in the McKinnon building or the Axelrod building, it's actually what we're doing here and now. And, um, I mean, the one thing that I can feel confident saying is that uh, one of my book tutors in all of my scholarly life was Michel Foucault. And Foucault never gets, lets you get away with not paying attention to the way that you are always enacting and participating in habits that are often exactly the opposite of the things that we're espousing to change. Um, and that's true of what we're doing at this moment, so I'm going to say a few things about that. Um, so, slide one. I want you all just to look at this. I'll tell you when to change the slides. <laughs> so all of your eyes, if you can see it, just focus on that, not on me. That's, a fe that's actually a sculpture because it's done in thread and felt. And it's by a woman from uh, an inner woman named Victoria Mamguk Siakluk, who was the daughter of the famous Jesse Unark, or related to Jesse Unark. So that doesn't matter. The point is that's where we're going to look right now. And there's a point to that. Slide one. So Tilda Swinton, who I hope to marry someday, but, um, I read a really fun interview with her. Um, somebody had to chase her around to find her out on the heaths. She was with her four dogs. And um, she said, what I find incredible is that people think I'm an interesting person. Because I'm an actress, but that doesn't necessarily make me an interesting person. And um, she said, I'm just a woman who walks her dogs twice a day. So when I say I'm just a person who builds compost, it has some of that same um, cheek to it, but there's a point. It's one of the things that are deeply habituated institutionally. Are you looking? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is uh, the way that we're sitting right now. The assumption that if we sit and we use our eyes and we look up here, that there's some kind of truthiness that's going to emanate from this person in this podium. Um, that we sit still, that we're facing forward. And I don't know if you can see it, but this is a structure formally for a man. So this is a form of the many and the one, which if anything is a Judeo-Christian structure. So this very like set up in the room that we might be honestly and deeply and authentically committed to critiquing some other part of our everyday. In this everyday, we're actually reproducing it. And um, I could name about a thousand more things that are actually part of 
part and parcel of you know just business as usual as academics. So I I want to be um, you can tell by the fact that I took early retirement that I have some reservations and some level of a complicated relationship with being an academic. But at the same time, I'm so grateful for having been asked to be here. It's not an either or. So um, you're still watching. <laughs> okay, slide number two. Uh, close your eyes. So I have a critical stance toward philosophy and academia, even though I'm very happy to be included sometimes in that demographic. Like now, I don't identify as a philosopher with ease, and perhaps my background in science and my love of poetry is partly to blame. As a scientist, and I have practice as a scientist too, I was always a bit of a, 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 bit of a difficult one in the lab, and I remember my uh, NSERC immunology director saying to me, your questions are too philosophical for the lab. So I was trying to be a good scientist, but my love of philosophy was getting in the way. And I think that I'm, um, I know myself to be also quite uh, ambivalent about associating, being associated with the word writer or poet. And so I'm not just being autobiographical here, I want to say that in my experience, Having three sort of loves, like a tripod, we are known as the two foot uprights. Um, but thinking about threes, having a sort of a foot or a hand or a heart in three places, disciplinary places. And at the same time, having um, ambivalence of some kind to those shifts, with all due respect, and you're can on slide number three. Shifts this figure slightly. We've still got the three. Oh, but in no sense do we have. Are we allowed to open our eyes? Yes. Oh. Slide number three. Open your eyes. <laughs> What's the slide three? Look at me. <laughs> it, um, so I want to really lean importantly and experientially on something more capacious than just dialogue. I think trialogue is fundamental. It has shown itself to be fundamental as a methodology for producing something generative but that this so perfect little shield at the bottom I would deform it somehow so that it's not just a sort of perfect target placement of where sort of the maximal truthiness can be found. So some sort of ambivalent and yet mobile and fluid relationship through three, um, three loves, three passions. They don't have to be disciplinary. Um, and I'm not just speaking from myself, I'm speaking about what I think uh, we are and we can be. So I'll just, I'll just, uh, this is very short, so uh, I want to suggest um, that this kind of configuration, co-participation in at least three ways of knowing, and the thing that I wanted to shift is to think, it's really, really important that we recognize our habit of thinking of truth as a reified, episodic thing that we grab hold of and to um, reflect back to something that Barry Lopez taught us and Catherine brought into the room today. Um, that itself, that version of truth and holding and grasping makes it seem as though truth is a thing rather than truth is a process and there's something on the move. So um, whatever this is at the middle, it's got a particular kind of motion to it. And what I've been thinking about for a long time is that different disciplines and different loves, whether it's working with wool, they are not they are working with particular things and material, and they might be having certain truth. But what if we start to think of them as different forms of actions? Very, very different forms of actions. So that working with felt in the north, and um, working with water in New York City, and translating Japanese texts, for instance, are three very, very different activities. And what I think we should be very interested in looking at and watching are the peculiar capacities or actions that arise out of those intersections. So the last thing I'm going to say is that those, so I'll just, um, I'll just wrap up here. Um, 
that this configuration, co-participations in three ways of knowing, uh, which is a kind of collaboration, but it's putting a little bit more specificity to it, is the key to discovering um, these new truths or new methods or new possibilities. So I'm just trying to put some, some, some form to that. In Foucault's phrasing, each one of our activities is or has a new kind of power, a new power, and at the intersections of these, an absolutely new power emerges. I want to confirm and affirm that this configuration does not have to be poetry, biology, philosophy. It could be engineering, dance, and wool working. It could be primary education, cello, and anthropology. It could be theoretical physics, water work, and child care. So a productive combination, and productive in the sense of a response to climate change, et cetera, that finds ourselves in the middle of that situation, um, is a very, very promising working figure. Last slide. You're gonna look toward that wall and find something, let your eye, let your eye find a connection with something that you've seen on this wall. Just let your eye find it. I believe that this sort of emergent possibility is especially, uh, especially generative and especially possible if the individuals involved, who do not have to be all human, have some levers of distance or some ambivalence to those areas of expertise. And that is because that way there can be disavowals and shifts in actions that allow other ideas and ideologies and ways of doing things to enter and leave the spaces. So keeping your eyes that way, I just want you to enjoy that your eye might have found a relation in the space that we're in. And um, as Tarlick Partridge said, one of the worst things about doing uh, curatorial work with First Nations and Northern people's art is it still uses a kind of beautiful backdrop for what we're doing, and that's itself a, um, a big problem. Not unlike what Madur said about ecology seeing the human as somehow separate. So we're in this space, and it would be um, silly if we didn't somehow integrate our own powers of tender attention while we're doing this. Now, because every poet in the room knows what it's like to be kind of like the dessert in a science thing. So, um, <laughs> so just leave it. No dessert. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Well, first of all, I have to apologize because I was going to bring you some really nice visuals from the land here today. But unfortunately, sometime between last night and this morning, my USB uh, key broke in my purse. I guess that's what happens if you don't use it for two years because we had a pandemic. And first time I'm not bringing my laptop, so kind of uh, uh, not the greatest way to start this, but I think it's, it's going to work anyways. Um, my name is Stephanie sobeck Swand, and I'm the Executive Director of Ch REA Charitable Research Reserve, which is an urban land trust and environmental institute uh, located in Waterloo Region, but we also steward lands here in Wellington and are looking at some areas in Guelph as well. So my personal background is in biodiversity and ecology. I completed a PhD degree in Germany and then moved to Canada in 2008. Uh, and after a variety of postdoc positions, I settled into my community-based role at RARE in 2014. And today I wanted to spend some time to introduce you to how RARE, as a not-for-profit organization and an environmental charity, brings art and science together and can serve as a partner to universities and arts-based organizations and individual artists as well. So how does RARE fit into this? Uh, as a land trust and environmental institute, our priority at RARE really is conservation. And over the past few years, we have worked with the community at large to develop a land securement strategy for Waterloo Region and Wellington that will see more and more land hopefully protected for conservation over time. And RARE's original site, uh, which was just over 900 acres, was protected in 2001 when the charity was founded and is located kind of nestled right at the heart of where uh, Kitchener and Cambridge and North Dumfries uh, come together near the 401 entrance. And in 2019, we also protected our first 87 acres in Wellington and additional properties have come under the umbrella of RIA since then or are in progress um, to be stewarded by RIA. 
We also have a network of 14 kilometers of trails that are free and open to the public. And we already know that uh, over 5,000 species live on these properties and across about 24 different habitat types. So what does this all really mean? Well, places like RARE provide green space and habitat for many plants and animals and other species to thrive, including ourselves as well. And not just through recreational opportunities, but also through the clean air, the fresh water, and all those um, services the land provides to us. So they also but offer an opportunity for engagement and inquiry with the land in various ways. So while conservation is our priority, Environmental research has always been our priority program, and so far this research at RIA has resulted in over 110 different research projects and um, around 65 peer-reviewed publications. And in fact, when we did our last strategy and planning process, we really made learning and inquiring one of our key focus areas. And this also came with an acknowledgement that everything is really tightly connected and also a responsibility that we want to listen more and better to the land and its people. So this also came with a commitment for our land stewardship, research and education to really move closer together and amplifying programs and partnerships that use various forms of, of inquiry or in, include uh, various forms of being, uh, including also scientific and artistic inquiry. And kind of the key goal or the question that we are trying to ask is really how do we want to live going forward? And at the core of this is also an ongoing engagement and connection with the land itself. So in 2014, we started a formal partnership with Musa Geddes, which you may be familiar with because it's a, a Guelph-based arts organization that wants to make the arts more relevant in people's lives. And we started a program now known as the Eastern Coma Artists in Residence Program. And uh, we actually own a number of major facilities and this program is run out of North House. So I have a picture of North House here um, and it's from our strategy and plans. It speaks about spaces that helps us achieve our goals. And really North House made it possible to have an artist in residence staying at Rare every year for a couple of months each fall and to really immerse themselves on the land, in the land. Uh, engage with the organization at the level they desire. And in fact, we have our inaugural artist in residence here, Karen Wunder tonight, and our most uh, most recent one, Liz Howard, as well, which feels like it's really coming full circle. So since this program has has started, I think we had uh, had about 14 uh, different residences now. Uh, sometimes we had a couple each year, not just one. I think we had a little bit of a break during the first year of the pandemic. But it's really been, been flourishing and the picture that I was going to show you was actually a gathering at North House in 20, um, 2015 where the late Lee Miracle stayed at Rare. Uh, it was just a fantastic event and we, we really all miss, miss her dearly and uh, she was the first um, indigenous artist who was part of the program. And since then the program really has evolved a fair bit uh, to primarily support indigenous artists which is really one uh, of the key focus area we want to really have the, the program focused on going forward. So this being said, we also um, uh, in this year developed another program together with Music at East to amplify these existing efforts, which is now called the Question Mark Butterfly Residency. And this new program is really intended to foster repeated shorter stays and engagement of the artists with the sites if desired, but overall runs over a longer period of time. And our first participant in this program was Alexandra Gillis, who is a Toronto-based Colombian, Venezuelan, Canadian artist, curator and researcher. Um, and she's very much focused on multimedia art installations that combine film and photography and, and new media and interactive electronic and sounds engagement. And uh, her work also includes research to investigate the ecologies of various landscapes. So it was a, a really good fit and also a good example of what we're trying to accomplish because we don't just want to use uh, rare or the land as a gallery space, but there should be a real kind of engagement and connection with the environment. So while at North House, Scalis uh, captured images and sounds 
unique to the areas nearby, and she also examined invasive Phragmites um, plants um, to work with them later on. And she also worked with our children who came in for the summer camp programs. So there's a real connection of the arts space and research based programs into our education programs as well. So um, the last thing I wanted to show you was uh, really um, a lot of different projects have happened since the inception of RARE. The best starting point, if you want to know more, is go to the Arts Everywhere website and plug in RARE. There's an article by Mike Young that really summarizes very nicely uh, in a long form essay the work that happened from 2001 to 2013. We've done so much since, I think it's time to sort of write a part two. And I also wanted to point out of you, to you that in um, in, I think in May next year, we have a, a project coming up that is, um, that is led by Jane Tingley. It's called Resituating More Than Human, which is going to be a series of events that brings together academics, scientists, indigenous knowledge keepers and artists. And it links into an exhibition she's also holding at um, a gallery in Toronto. So keep your eyes peeled or sign up for our newsletter if you're interested in that. Uh, or speak to me. I have my cards here that I can give you. I also have some of our publications if you're interested. And yeah, this is it. Thank you so much. If you haven't been to Rare, it's not far from here in Cambridge. And they have, it's, they have beautiful trails, diverse rare, uh, rare, like actually rare, um, all of our uh, grassland systems, um, you know, these calcareous grasslands and many other uh, nice places. So, and um, yeah, so I encourage you. And tomorrow we're going to go for a walk, some of us, um, there around two o'clock. So if you wanted to join us, just let me know and we'll tell you where to meet. Um, and also, if you want to meet Faisal, which you do, um, he's, uh, you can find him tomorrow at 9.30 at the sort of affiliated event that we have at the Wild Writers Festival. Wild Writers Festival is a, is a newish uh, literary festival uh, in the Kitchener-Waterloo area. And it's on the campus of the University of Waterloo, and we're going to have an event, a reading, a more broader conversation that... Faisal is going to moderate. He told me he will be able to be there tomorrow. He just couldn't make it today. Um, yeah, and from what I know about Faisal um, and what I think he would want, have wanted to share today, uh, he works, uh, he and his colleague, Dr. Robin Roth, is, uh, are the co-leaders of an of initiative at the University of Guelph called um, Conservation Through Reconciliation Partnership. They have their website. Please check it out. It's quite beautiful and they have a lot of very... We're going to play a short video on it for you. And um, because they are, they are... Yeah, it's a concept. Let's play the video first and then I might say something. Newspapers, scientific reports, TV documentaries, and youth advocates all rightly point to our worsening situation. The million species go extinct. Fires burning, rivers flooding, seas rising. There are three overwhelming responses to these stories of crises. One, indifference. Number two, feelings of futility. Our calls to fight climate change and unfairness. The collective vision of the Conservation Through Reconciliation Partnership reflects none of these responses. Rather, it is to heal. Not fight, turn our backs, or give up, but to heal. Heal the relationships between humans and our planet. Amongst humans and non-human beings. And it is urgent. Which is why we cannot keep throwing more scientific data, more money, and more effort at the same old colonial systems. We need to be bold. Be transformative. We need to cultivate conservation practices and policies rooted in healthy relationships, rooted in indigenous knowledge systems, governance, and laws. Indigenous conservation is aimed not at saving the last of nature from humanity, but rather enacting a collective responsibility to care for, nurture, and create abundance of life on Earth. 
These are ideas and practices embedded in the very earliest of treaties. Promise of pipe ceremonies. Passed on from generation to generation. We can do this. We can bring together an array of indigenous knowledge systems and Western sciences to craft a future where the earth is healing and humanity honors and protects non-human relations. The work of the Conservation Through Reconciliation Partnership is about creating a shared process of understanding to create, share, and transfer knowledge to strengthen all of the good work we are doing to support and amplify Indigenous-led conservation. Knowledge is a gift, not a commodity. And we treat it as such. We are bound by mutual respect, reciprocity, shared relationships, and a deep concern for our current condition, and a conviction that bringing about reconciliation in the conservation world will result in the transformation necessary to heal the planet. And as we heal together, we, we rise together. Yeah. Anyway, um, I do invite you to read more about Faisal and Faisal's work and Robin's work and the whole partnership's work um, on that website. Um, I was just going to tell a little teeny tiny anecdote of something that somehow popped into my mind as an image when Karen was reminding us of this structure. Um, that's, I don't know, I'll just tell it and then you can see what you think about it. But uh, I, I work a little bit with uh, an indigenous community in India. Uh, we work on um, these forest grassland mosaics that occur in mountainous regions. We work in Brazil and we work in India. and. Um, they're very unique ecosystems because forests coexist with grasslands on a mosaic, and it's, it's a very unusual, you know, situation because usually, you know, usually you have either grasslands or forests because of the way that, because of ecology. <laughs> and um, but for um, in a for for in certain places with certain temperatures and certain disturbance regimes, including human um, interaction. These forests occur in patches, in these mosaic patches, and they're very fascinating from a complex systems perspective. But also, um, in the areas in India where they occur, um, it's, a, it's a very um, finite area that's, all, that's protected now, but it's under the uh, governance of an indigenous, an, indigenous, an, indigenous, an indigenous population. And the reason I say that is because it's this group called the Toda, there are um, only 1,000 uh, individuals of this tribe <laughs> living there, and they, they hold the governance uh, of that. They, they are pastoral. Um, they use the grasslands for grazing wild buffalo. Uh, they do do some agriculture as well, and the forests are also sacred to them. The forest patches are sacred to them, and they have lived in these mosaics which are disappearing um, because of um, modern agriculture and um, climate change. They have lived, but they, this group has lived with these coexisting states for, you know, millennia. Millennia? <laughs> Maybe not millennia. A millennia or more. Um, and um, so much so that the, the, the knowledge, the traditional knowledge and culture co-evolved with, with these dual states. And, you know, being led through these ecosystems with um, Know, um, an elder of that, that population of, of, of the Toda, uh, Torte, a couple of times of, during my visits there, um, you know, we only begin to uh, see the, the, the breadth and depth of the indigenous knowledge that is carried by these, these groups with, with respect to these forests and grasslands with respect to medicinal uses, spiritual uses of, of the species. But there was one little anecdote he told us that struck me, and I've never forgotten it, and I always think of it, uh, because it's so entwined with the preservation of this mosaic. Um, and it reminded me of the structure, too, because we were sitting down on the grassland, and there was a forest patch. And, um, um, and he said, you know, we can't, it's getting harder for us to practice our marriage, marriage rituals because 
In order to have the marriage ritual, we need both grassland and forest. Because, I'm going to have to get this right, uh, because um, the guests must be all seated in the grassland. <laughs> and the couple must be under the shade of a tree. Otherwise, the marriage does not, the ceremony is not possible. So they need them both. Like, it was just so um, beautiful and striking. And um, there are many, many other uh, practices that require both, so many of them. Like, the, even just keeping the water buffalo, the, from, from a practical point of view, the more the, they, they, they put the water buffalo in the forest to, um, find what to have water and shade, and then they come out to graze and so on. So there was just this, this incredible you know, process. Okay, we are now, now our next speaker, Natasha Matre, um, also had some issues. <laughs> she was also, she's from Western, and um, she's a scientist, and I don't know that she would, I don't know, I wish she was here to tell you about herself, but I discovered her because if you go to her webpage, you'll see that she has her whole scientific lab and she does incredibly fascinating scientific work. Can we just look at her overall webpage first? Um, like the, just the main page? Home, perhaps? Look at that. The biophysics of communication. Who knew? That was, you know? Um, and uh, yeah, so let's just read that at the top. Let's just go to the top. We study acoustic and vibratory communication. Anyway, she had some, also another a family emergency. She could not be here today. She apologizes. Uh, we study acoustic and vibratory communication in insects and spiders. We mainly focus where the biology and physics intersect. So yes, interdisciplinary already. Um, on the one hand, we're interested in how the morphology, physics, and dynamics of a sensory system enhances its function i.e. an embodied enhancements of cognition. We're also interested in how the animal's environment, behavior, and even objects that animals make may be drawn in to assist and optimize communication, and so on and so on. Sounds really fascinating, but look, there's a menu item called Science and Art on her webpage. I went to, I won't tell you the story of how I found her. It's really interesting. And I did, had no idea that she did science and art. I was actually interested in her science. But alas, here it is. She's an artist, visual artist, and she did this amazing TED Talk, so we're going to just draw from it today and, 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 and um, um, about her art and science connection. And we're going to watch it for a little bit. Did you have to go? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to go. Yeah. And that yeah. is how my play, The Real Tragedy, begins. In this play, three scientists walk into a bar watch a nature documentary and discuss the science that they see in the nature documentary. And I thought, watch them. I look at how scientists create knowledge, what, how they structure their arguments about the science that they're seeing, what their premises and their assumptions are. But unfortunately, you're not going to be able to watch the scientists because you don't have enough time. All you're going to be able to see is the end of this play in which the bartender who we just met tells you what he thinks of the entire enterprise. There. Lined up in the strings. Put the boxes in the palms and the things. This tells the total. All laid to rest. No. Both. Very best. They'll be back next week. And, and she too. It's not as if they live to argue. A conversation that did not be an honor war has to have a story's discord at its core. If everyone agreed, they say, the ones agree, then no one would say anything interesting. It is in debate that the truth is converged upon. New questions build on old answers, and our truth is constantly refined. We begin at extremes, they say, and somehow find it. Hmm. Or if they're lucky, they fail. Grab a beer. Start again, and tell another tall tale. Ladies and gentlemen, my Kinect Garden.
So after that brief performance, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about why I write stories like this one. Um, or why, as I was said about me, I take photographs, and why I made all of these photographs into a book while I was doing a PhD in uh, insect sound communication. Or why I make graphic art, which is based in science. These are uh, art pieces made based on the scientific papers that talk about these animals. And then I build the animals back from the words that we say about them. Or why indeed do I write stories? So a lot of my friends that knew that I do this sort of thing, that I do both science and I do different forms of art, sent me an ad about a year ago about, for this place called the Wiesenschaft Collegs in Berlin, which is how I'm here. And what this place does is sort of unique. It asks about 40 people from the academy, scientists, social scientists, historians, writers, composers, to come together and live and work together for a year. And I thought, wow, I want to do that. And so I came and wanted to go to the Wiesenschaft. The problem with this was I had to tell them why I wanted to do that. That's actually quite a difficult question. Because why you want to do that? Well, up until then, I'd just done it because I felt like doing it. I didn't write stories for the purpose, I just wrote stories because stories were there to be told. And now I had to think about why I was going to do it. And so I started thinking about it, and the first thing that came to my mind is an essay I read when I was younger, which is Isaiah Berlin's essay, The Hedgehog and the Fox. And in this essay, he talks about the thinkers in the world and how the thinkers in the world think about it. And he splits the world into two sorts of people, the hedgehogs and the foxes. The hedgehogs, well, let's start with the foxes. The fox knows many things, he says. The fox, when he's hunted, will try all sorts of different strategies to get away from the hunter. He'll try and get into the water, he'll try and burrow, he'll try and climb up trees. But the hedgehog, the hedgehog knows one big thing. The hedgehog will just curl into a ball and expect that's going to solve everything. Anyway, the world is full of hedgehogs and foxes, and he lists a whole series of men, and of course they're always men. There are hedgehogs and foxes. And I like to split the hedgehogs and foxes into two words, the specialists and this wonderful word that's gone away from the word, polymaths, people who do many things. And I thought, well, I'm a fox. Doesn't answer why I'm a fox, but I'm a fox. Um, it still didn't answer what I had to tell the reason Chef Kaleg about, so I started thinking a little bit more about why am I a fox, why am I a fox? And something one of my professors used to say to me came back, when you come and answer a question, it's not because you're dumb, it's because the question is dumb. If you can frame your question better, the answer becomes self-evident. So let's unpack this question I've been asking, why do I do this? That's evidently a dumb question. So let's unpack it. Who is this I? Who is this I I'm talking about? And this I is somebody who's no longer a student. And the reason I say this is it's extremely clear to most of the world today that if you're a student, you want to do both the arts and the sciences. It's, not, it, it's a consensus we've all reached, I think, more or less. And you know, if you're unconvinced, Go and read, uh, go and look at a couple of dead dogs, which is Ken Robinson's talk and Mae Jameson's talk. They make extremely good arguments for why, if you're a student, you want to be uh, both an artist and a scientist at the same time. I'm talking about me as a practicing scientist. I am somebody who studies how insects make sound and how insects hear sound. What's that got to do with art? Why would I do it? It begins starting to answer why a practicing scientist would do art, starts with asking why a practicing scientist wouldn't do art. If you think back in, in the generations before science became a profession as it is today, people did everything. They did whatever it pleased them to do. But at some point, and uh, you have to go to this argument by C.P. Snow called the two cultures, people stopped doing this. The two, in the two cultures, this is a lecture that C.P. Snow gave uh, at Cambridge, the Reed Lectures. He talked about how the world in the academy had split into these two cultures. These two cultures that never ever spoke to each other. The humanities and the sciences. 
And not only did they never speak to each other, they also actively sneered at each other. It just kind of sad. When he was talking about this, which is in 959, I think, it was the humanities that had the upper hand. Yeah. So we're going to have to stop it there, but you know, when you have time, please go in and listen to it, and hopefully there'll be another occasion for to bring Natasha here. Um, things calm down a little bit, if they ever do. Um, next we have Liz Howard. Hello, Hi. Uh, I'm Liz. I'm a, a poet, educator, and editor based uh, in Toronto, um, but I'm visiting currently from the Rare Charitable Research Reserve, where I'm the current writer in residence. <clears throat> and my, uh, my educational and work background is in uh, psychology and neuroscience, as well as creative writing. And I'm going to be joining the Concordia's English Department as an assistant professor uh, of creative writing uh, in June. And I'd like to thank uh, Matt Herr for inviting me here to share a little bit about my work today. So as a mixed settler and indigenous woman from an isolated rural town in northern Ontario, whose economy is predicated on the dispossession of indigenous lands towards the exploitation of so-called natural resources, namely game animals, lumber, and minerals, I hope to carry forward in my work an ecological consciousness that is rooted in the ongoing socio-historical processes that led to its development. When I speak about ecological consciousness, I mean not only the recognition of sets of complex and meshed systems of interrelation between humans and the environment, but also the extension of the concept of relation, filial and even spiritual, between any subject position and its others, animate and inanimate, a sense of radical cohesion. My view can best be typified by a concept of two-eyed seeing, in which both indigenous and western knowledges and ways of knowing mutually inform and direct scientific inquiry, and that indigenous knowledge is scientific and not wholly other or opposed to the rigors of the scientific method of observation, hypothesis, <clears throat> excuse me, formation, experimentation, analysis, and generative discussion. In my first book, uh, Infinite Citizen of the Shaking Tent, I explored the Anishinaabe oracular rite of the shaking tent, in which knowledge is sought from the beyond human world as a metaphor for poetic inquiry. I wove together the deep ancestral thinking of Anishinaabe cosmology with concepts from Western science, notably environmental science, astronomy, archaeology, and psychology. In my poem, Terra Nova Terraformed, I wrote, I hunt along a creek as you pack bits of bone away within a system of conservation. The site was discovered during construction of a new Venice highway for stars birthing themselves out of pyroclastic dust and telepathy in the time zone of some desperate hour when all our exits are terraformed. Sons and daughters of the liberal arts, all my life has spurned a desire for more than a power line of injured transistors, fetal alcohol syndrome, oil drums sunk to the bottom of every lake, the aurora borealis, an overdose along the magnetized pole. And for example, in another poem from the collection, I wrote about water contamination in the context of colonization. In our settler dreams, plexiglass teeth were stuck in the hide of the ravine, a freeway of copper wire and sugarbush metabolics, Copernican limbs, mercury in the water, little silver pills tracing a path through the lake bed of submerged logs to a trap of current under rock, all our odd love and petrochemicals not otherwise specified. In my latest book, um, Letters in a, in a Bruised Cosmos, I braid together Western and Anishinaabe cosmology, uh, as well as uh, astrophysics, to examine the ongoing impacts of, of contact. I, I wrote about the cosmic microwave background cold spot, a possible cosmic bruise left by the impact of another universe on our own primordial universe and uh, Begana Gishik, or the hole in the sky, a constellation corresponding to the Pleiades, which is seen as the originating and spiritual home of humanity and our relations. And I will close with a brief poem uh, from that collection. Probability Cloud. 
The universe broadcasts its lifespan in radiant heat. I need to believe my account will outpace its ending. Technical oracle, a feed that repeats itself, a reckoning. What I felt was complete disorientation, but the night strike sky is more than a map to read into the end and origin of everything. There is a guilt that folds into me like humanity, a darkness in the signal. A marked science confides as evidence of another universe, the collision of an afterbirth. If I continue, can I hold the body beyond its contact traces of violation and intimacy? The palimpsest furniture of our specious present, a succession of excess. I am here, after all, for decadence and silence. See this decadence, a bloom beneath the skin of my invitation? Not truth, but surface, the hole in the sky. Thank you for your kind attention. Well, as you can see, I am so tied to print culture that I had to print out my poems and pass them out. And uh, I'm, I'm aware of what Karen said about how we are, no matter what our thoughts are, we are still um, implicated in practices that are suboptimal, for instance, wasting paper, but that's, <laughs> and also flying to conferences. <clears throat> so I doubt that anything I'm going to say now is going to be worth the uh, carbon dioxide that that airplane threw into the air, but nonetheless, here we go. <laughs> um, I'm a poet, obviously, and I, uh, also, and retired from UC San Diego, I've uh, been interested in various sciences and read in them for, uh, I, I had no time to be a scientist, but I have read sort of extensively in a couple of sciences. Um, anyway, what I think poets can do is discover new connections between ideas, between different ways of seeing. One well-known tool of poetry is metaphor. In Greek, metaphor means to carry a cross. In my poetry, often, metaphors are more implicit than explicit, but the carrying a cross is there, I hope. Too often, our ways of thinking, and everyone has been saying this today, our ways of thinking, vocabulary, and information are siloed away in various disciplines, and we don't see how they might connect. Our culture encourages specialization, I've written poetry since I was six, and I've been interested in science since I was 12 or so. That's when I rejected the fundamentalist Christianity I was raised with. All it took was exposure to Greek mythology for me to decide that Adam and Eve, etc., must be myths too. But then, how did the universe begin? I became interested in cosmology. Um, and I started reading about, you know, the Big Bang Theory versus what the steady state theory, which way back in the 60s and the early 60s still had some adherence. Um, I was especially interested, I think, in the questions that science raised more than in the practice of doing science. I found that I often begin a poem when something puzzles me, when something gives me pause, and it could be anything. I might be wondering why that crow is hopping around and staring into the hole the city dug in my street to fix a water main. I saw that and put that in a poem. Or I might wonder why minor key music makes us sad. I long enjoyed reading articles and books written by scientists for lay people to answer or try to answer some of the questions I've wondered about. But sometimes, of course, these books leave me wondering, too. Uh, so some of my experiences are, uh, I, at UC San Diego, I taught a course called Poetry for Physicists with a physicist named Brian Keating. Uh, later, at a conference put on by Amy Contensano, who you, you heard, um, at Wake Forest University, uh, the conference brought uh, poets and physicists together. I had a conversation with physicist Mark Cruz, who said he was there to get better metaphors for scientists to use when explaining the structure of the atom, because, as most of you know, the one that they were using, the solar system metaphor, wasn't at all accurate. So in a spirit of play, I took him up on it 
and wrote the following poem, the one called Transfer, which you have in your past. Uh, so anyway, I was, I was goofing around with his idea. I didn't expect this to show up in a textbook any time soon. Anyway, Transfer. Now they tell us orbit is wrong. Electrons, <coughs> electrons don't actually orbit a nucleus. Perhaps they are looking for the word haunt. One meaning of haunt is too frequent, to be known to appear. They say electrons leap from non-existent, rung to rung, giving off energy, as a ghost may vanish from one room to materialize in the next, causing the audience to jump. <laughs> Good evening, <everybody. laughs> As the years went on, my interest broadened, and I started reading books by cognitive scientists and neurologists, especially books on the nature of consciousness, which I learned is still hotly debated, even now. I think I was especially interested, interested in how, it seems, we can know something and also not know. You know, like, for instance, how we're evidently destroying our ecosystems and yet, you know, and yet, not, and yet not believe it or, or ignore it. And I also developed an interest in neuroscience to some extent recently because one of my twin granddaughters is, a, she's doing very well, but she's neurodiverse, which is interesting. Um, anyway, on top of that, in the last 10 years or so, I've gotten more and more alarmed by what's going on, what's happening to the climate and what it means for this world and for our children. For one thing, I live on the West Coast. That's about all it takes. I spent most of my life in California and then moved to the Seattle area. People tend to know about the drought and the fires in California, but did you know that for, the, uh, for, the, for a few days in the middle of this month, October, Seattle had the worst air quality of any city in the world? The world because wildfires of the wildfires burning nearby. When you live on the West Coast, climate is hard to ignore. Anyway, most of the poems I've written about climate and environment are also to a large extent about why people seem unable to come together and deal with the evident danger. So now I'm going to read uh, two poems. Uh, Notice is the first one. And it's really about that, about how people don't see what's right in front of them. <clears throat> Notice, the way a gesture used to ward off trouble became cheerful waving. There was so much looming and vanishing to take note of, always. We felt like play actors before we knew what we were about and after. Turns out the mummy's curse is real. You pump thick death out of the ground and burn it, it kills you. But in all the movies, curses are a cheap plot trick. The doofus who can't read the hieroglyph dies first, and no one misses him. Then, we were born yesterday. We're sorry. And then I'll read freeze tag. There's also about how we're killing ourselves, really, but it's a bit more lyrical. <laughs> Freeze tag. In spring, with the fire thorn, pimples with hard buds. In summer, when the rose drops its rosy discards. In fall, when the trees go up in flames. In winter, when the kitsch fantasies of shelter go on sale. In spring, when, full of toxins, we're interred in today's clothes. And then I'm going to read one more poem, which is going to be in Scientific American, actually. Did you, did you know, have you noticed that Scientific American now has a poetry poem? Most of the poems that are in it I don't like much, actually, and <laughs> sadly, since I've got to have poems in it. But the reason that I don't like them, usually, is that I find that what they do um, is kind of summarize some scientific finding, adding line breaks, of course, and perhaps some flourishes. 
In other words, they don't bring different discourses and perspectives together. And I think poets' poems need to engage the mind and the emotions and to leave us stirred up, to unsettle and not to solve things. Anyway, so this is nonetheless fairly light. It's called Fractal. Everyone likes fractals. <laughs> <laughs> Although in, in this case, they're well anyway. Um, so this will be my last thing. Fractal. If I were made of homunculi, the way a cauliflower head is made of little noggins, would I be gorgeous? Like this green one, a field of rockets, each nippled with hard cones? That was a question. Yeah. My name is Eric Knotts, and I am a faculty member in the Department of Geography, Environment, and Geomatics here at the University of Guelph, which I think probably could just be called Department of Geography, because it was in the past, because I think geography is a very, it encompasses so much. Um, but for branding purposes, we're the Geography, Environment, and Geomatics Department. And I'm also the chair of the Governance Committee for GEAR, so I want to, in that capacity, thank everyone for coming out today. I'm sorry I couldn't be here for longer. I just got here, I was teaching in the morning, I couldn't, couldn't get out of that. So, um, I'll say a little bit more about my background, very briefly, uh, because it is relevant to, to answering the prompt we provided with. Uh, but I won't say that much because we all want to eat. Uh, so I am a geographer, and I love being a geographer because I think it encompasses so much. It provides uh, inherently a very interdisciplinary way of understanding and being in the world, uh, for me at least in the sense that geography, much as we could say maybe history as a discipline takes its time as its object of inquiry, geography is all about everything in a place or in space. Um, so the, the only sort of bounding the discipline theoretically does is where are we talking about? But in terms of once we've you know, kind of determined that space, uh, we, we were given more or less free reign to um, investigate anything about that place. Whether it's you know, the, the sense of place from a humanistic perspective to the dynamics of soil moisture in that place from a more uh, natural sciences perspective. Um, so I was actually brought into the discipline of geography or to geography as a thing, um, more from the, the humanistic perspective in terms of sense of place. Um, and indeed, a lot of what I did as a, as a younger student um, was around trying to understand sense of place and try to understand um, what places meant to different people over time. And, you know, disciplines, as they do, as the name implies, you know, force you to specialize. Um, and so over time, I, I moved away from that kind of work to uh, looking at governance. So I am a social scientist, so uh, I you know, eventually started studying uh, governance, the, the environmental governance, and the way that uh, we make decisions about how to manage environments, and who's included in those decisions and who isn't. Uh, and even more recently, uh, my research has been uh, involving sort of a more of a, a data science approach to taking data that we have relevant to environmental governance and, and trying to analyze that. And that's kind of where I pick up this prompt of, you know, how do or would you want to work between disciplines to discover new truths about the environment and our relationship to it? And, you know, I, I like to think that I do a little bit of this work, but certainly not myself. Uh, I do it in collaboration with a group called the Environmental Data and Governance Initiative, or EDU. Uh, and so I just want to highlight that collaboration because it means a lot to me as a researcher who's able to um, uh, work in a disciplinary way. So EDGY is, is um, uh, an organization mostly based out of the U.S., although it has its roots um, in Canada as well, that focuses on um, a comprehensive analysis of environmental governance 
in the data that is used to inform decisions about managing the environment. It formed in late 2016 in response to the election of, of Trump in, in the US. And it was formed by not only academics, and academics ranging from history to sociology to library science to um, you know, uh, natural sciences, but also different professionals from different professional sectors. So archivists, uh, software developers, and, and so on. And so in EDGY, our goal really has been to discover new truths about the environment from existing public sources of data. You know, governments collect all sorts of data about environmental conditions, conditions that matter to people, as well as to um, just uh, ecologies. Uh, but not all of that data is actually ever even made all that public or well known. So we seek to archive, understand, and make more public that data as well as to understand new truths about governance in general, just by understanding what data there is, how it's collected, what's not collected, and those kinds of questions. And what I think is, just want to highlight what I think is, is particularly unique or interesting or important to me about EDGY is, is again, this cross-professional component where, um, you know, I get to work with this group on an everyday basis that is not only <laughs> Uh, well, in fact, I'm the only geographer in, in the group, but it's not only academics, but some of my closest collaborators are, for instance, you know, a retired software developer, um, uh, you know, uh, again, librarians, archivists, all oriented around this question, or the, actually this object, um, which is data and trying to understand it in, it, in and of itself, but also um, sort of the context around it. So that's, that's one way in which I'm actually doing um, uh, work between disciplines and between sectors to discover new truths about our environment. But, you know, inspired by what I've heard in just a little bit of time I've, I've been here in our, our workshop, uh, there's a lot missing in what EDGY does, and especially from the more humanistic perspective in terms of, well, we analyze this data about places and the kinds of environmental conditions in those places, but we don't necessarily really fully, from a humanistic perspective, understand what it means to be in those places, in those conditions. Um, sure, we can analyze the data, we can understand from a social science perspective the governance in those communities, but, um, you know, we don't have, you know, we don't necessarily have poets in energy, for instance, to help us make sense of it from a, uh, that perspective. So again, you know, thanks to everybody for joining us. And I wish, I really wish I could have been, you know, a fuller part of these conversations. And I'll turn it over to Madhur for an intro about next steps. Basically, develop an interdisciplinary workshop for high school students at the intersections of creative writing, environment, and art. Uh, oh, Stephanie, you should come too. Come up here. We're going to take a photo. So. <laughs> it was in collaboration with Rare. Um, and with the local arts uh, foundation, Music Yetis. And um, we wanted to host, oh, Catherine, yeah, anybody. <laughs> All of us. There was a lot of people involved. Um, anyone. Um, to, um, yeah, we, we, we wanted to have a, um, a, a, a sort of one week uh, workshop where we would bring, to, bring uh, researchers from here. In the, in the sciences, in the arts, etc., to interact with uh, some high school students who might be interested in exploring these intersections with us. So, um, related, but, and we, um, but we ran into a number of difficulties pandemic wise in terms of doing it the way we wanted to do it in person and in various locations. Uh, though we did meet them, we had some wonderful students from, I don't know, three or four high schools um, reach out to us. Uh, we had a, a small group and we uh, met on campus at the Arboretum. We had two days together in person, um, but we couldn't quite do everything. Anyway, this is the team mm. and we, uh, we um, and also additional faculty who are not here today, but what we did <laughs> Do through um, a bunch of Zoom interactions with the faculty who were involved, 
um, scientists, writers, etc., and also people, you know, um, not at, at the university, but you know, also interested in these things. We we developed this field, these field, this field guides for you, for them, for everybody, and so um, there's three of them. We they're kind of hot off the press, right? Yeah. Um, so we, we published them in collaboration with a local publisher called Publication Studio of Well. And you'll see that it's a bunch of sort of interactive exercises that um, anyone really can take. It's got QR codes. Oh, um, and yeah, I, I would love, you know, if you would like to have a look at that over lunch or whatever, there's a few um, sample copies there and we're gonna be printing them in greater quantities as well, and uh, perhaps we might find them useful for the various worlds you live in. Can I just say uh, um, one quick thing about that? Yeah. I think and our, I think we do. our goal with this was just to create something physical that people could take with them to explore a place. So it's something they can take to a backyard, a bus stop, some place that people want to interact with more, and so these kind of activities are uh, both a physical and a hybrid thing. So there are QR codes that link to our website that have things people can listen to, extra activities, extra readings that they can do, but we really wanted something that people could take with them and not be and tied write into it. a screen and write in and create in and color in and kind of work in a creative space physically, but also have that kind of the benefit that a virtual world does give to us of extra content, extra connections, communicating with each other. So this was kind of the, the culmination of all of those ideas kind of put into one book. Yeah, and all of the students were so amazing mm -hmm. and um, all equally interested in art and science, equally <laughs> interested in art and science and um, just felt like they had not been exposed to and very many opportunities within you know, their schools to, to do this type of thing. So. Um, we had, you know, we, we, we listened to them too and incorporated their feedback um, into this. So have a look, it's, it's me. Um, now, should we do the thing? We have like five minutes. No, we have one minute. <laughs> Some of you may be wondering what, um, why we have QR codes on your name tags. So at this time, I would like you to take your phone if you have one. If you don't, don't worry. Um, but if you do have a phone, put the volume up loud. And um, if you could somehow capture this videographer, that would be kind of cool. Because I hope it's going to work the way, the way we hoped it would work. Or uh, so we're going to scan on a QR code. And if it doesn't work right away, you know, just keep scanning it and put the volume way up. You want the volume up? You might have to take it up. Yeah, volume up. Oh, okay. <laughs> the volume Sound up. on. Are we going to explain it or are we just going to play it? No, we're just going to play it. All right. Let it take you to where it's going. Can you just add the you picked trial? Oh, I don't know. Is it working? Guys, I hope they all work. I hope we test it. If you need assistance in doing this, we will come around.